we have an all-star panel to discuss uh, the future of Afghanistan and a little bit of, of the past. Uh, joining us uh, from Washington, D.C. is Ambassador Roya Rahmani, who was ambassador from Afghanistan to the United States uh, until July of this year. Uh, she was the first woman to be appointed to that position. Uh, here on the stage is Saad Masseni, uh, who, has, who uh, is the chairman of the Moby Group, uh, which is part, Tolo TV is part of, uh, of that. Tolo TV is the most important source of news in Afghanistan, also the most important entertainment network. And also uh, Yannick Koskinas, a retired US Army, US Air Force Colonel, uh, who worked for a long time with Joint Special Operations Command and has worked, lived in Afghanistan since 2009 and has run a business there uh, for over a decade. So let me just start, uh, let me start with Ambassador Rahmani. Good morning, thank you for getting up very early in Washington. Good morning, good evening to you. <laughs> um, could things have turned out differently? And do you think President Ghani bears responsibility for how this turned out? Once again, greeting to you and everybody in audience, as well as the distinguished uh, panelists uh, on the stage. Could it have turned out differently? I believe so. I believe it could have been. Uh, a lot uh, better than, than it was managed. Uh, and uh, President Ghani did have uh, a role to play in this uh, throughout, at different stages, different roles, I would say. Uh, it should not have ended up uh, as a wholesale to the Taliban. Uh, and then uh, the, the, the way and the manner of the takeover uh, for them to just uh, cakewalk it and uh, come and take it uh, was also not the, uh, the way that was inevitable. Um, I believe that things could have been different and he did have a huge role to play all along. M meaning what? Well, uh, throughout the negotiations, uh, there was a very tough stance uh, from him at the point that it was very clear that uh, there is no way that there, uh, the next government to be formed would be headed by himself or any of his candidates, but he never gave up on that stance. Uh, he continued to push for it until the very last uh, minute, uh, while it was clear that that was a no-go. As a result, the room uh, for Afghan uh, government shrank continuously as the so-called negotiations went on. And now, about the merit of the negotiations, uh, it's a different question uh, to discuss, so whether it was right or wrong and how it could have been conducted, that, that's, that's a whole different discussion. But knowing and recognizing what was happening, and in a, our, one of our previous discussions, we, we did speak about uh, this, uh, where one of the negotiators clearly explained that by March, it was very clear that it was, at best, it would have been a 50-50 government, meaning 50% would go to the Taliban and the other 50% to the representatives of the Republic. But even then, uh, President Ghani uh, took a very uh, tough and difficult stance, not allowing that to materialize. So that, 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 that was at that point. And moving forward, everything got from bad to worse uh, uh, by day. So therefore, he had, he had a stake in the way he led uh, this situation, as well as, uh, of course, uh, his, the way he fled himself. Saad, do you agree with all that? I mean, how do you score as president? How, could things have turned out differently? What responsibility does President Ghani have for the situation that developed? He hit, hit, yeah. Um, well, the buck stops ultimately with, uh, with, the, with the leader of a, of, of a nation and uh, in, in the role that he had, A, to negotiate with the Taliban. He should have seen this coming for, for many, many years. 
it was obvious from the, from, from, uh, the early weeks when uh, Ambassador Khalilzad took over as a special envoy that there wasn't much of an appetite for uh, remaining in Afghanistan. Um, and those words were not uttered, but you could read between the lines that President Trump wanted to get out. So that's when he had most of the leverage. Uh, we still had a fair number of US troops. And uh, so I think that's one mistake. Um, the, 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 of course, the, the last couple of weeks was you know, the, the, the one that most people talk about, which is that he uh, refused to accept that there would be a, um, a new government. Uh, he had the opportunity to allow for a transition government uh, to take over. That would have helped Afghanistan. Um, and would have helped the people of the country. And again, he, he let the Afghans down. So going back to two, you know, 2019, all the way up until August 15th, he neglected his duties when it, when it came to peace talks, uh, attempting to generally negotiate a peace deal. Um, and then at the very end, to actually do the right thing, to do, to do the responsible thing. Um, it's, it's, you know, classic negligence uh, from where we stand. So he should have stayed? Well, he should have stayed long enough. I mean, he, the problem with Ashraf Ghani was that he kept on talking about how courageous he was and how he would rather die. Um, and, and, and sort of, you know, and of course, these clips are played over and over again on Afghan media. Um, it, it's... Uh, you know, if he, if he was willing to die for his country, then he should have stayed. Um, and oh, from what we understand, from what Biden has mentioned numerous times, including interviews with, with our journalists, is that they, they had given him certain assurances, and they've also, they had also received assurances from Ashraf Ghani in terms of um, his willingness to, to resign, to allow for this delegation to come to Qatar to meet with the Taliban, to think through some sort of a tr transitional arrangement that Kabul would not be uh, attacked. And assurances were given to different people. And as a matter of fact, when Kabul fell, uh, even people like us, I mean, our organization, were contacting the Taliban saying, listen, you may have to step, step in now because otherwise it's going to be anarchy and chaos. And I know that President Karzai, former President Karzai, did the same thing. The Taliban were not ready to take over the city, as it became apparent um, um, afterwards. But so it's you know, and today the situation today, a government that's not recognized, Afghan funds frozen offshore, the international community unwilling or unable to work in Afghanistan, 38 million people um, vulnerable to all types of things, from economic disaster to this drought. Um, uh, to massive internally displaced people's issue. Maybe we wouldn't have been facing the same challenges today if he had bothered to stay on. Tolu TV is still on the air? Yes. And how are you functioning? Well, I, I think, uh, you know, surprisingly, you know, I, if, if, if the situation is as it is today in six months, uh, I would be very pleased. So, uh, so far it's good, but you know, the, 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 the Taliban haven't had the bandwidth to deal with the media, to deal with civil society. Um, and, uh, you know, I, 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 I foresee a, uh, a more restrictive environment. Um, will, will we still be able to operate as we are today? I, I'm not sure. Um, and if it becomes too restrictive, then it's probably not worth our while to stay on. Yanni, um as a military um, officer, um, why did the Afghan army collapse so quickly? There's a narrative they didn't fight, uh, which obviously is, isn't the case, but why did they collapse so quickly in, you know, in the months leading up to the takeover? Well, I, I think that there's, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question. It's a lot to unpack there. Uh, but I think when we look at the so-called collapse of the Afghan military, I think you have to actually consider it a little bit further back than the 11 days that everybody wants to focus on. 
Uh, for years, we've been talking about this rhetoric that borders fantasy, that, um, that uh, the, the, uh, the conflict in Afghanistan cannot be resolved on the battlefield. Well, clearly it was. Um, <laughs> the other one that, uh, you know, we, that was perpetuated for a long time was the Taliban cannot win on the battlefield. Once again, that was clearly uh, proven otherwise. Um, but if you look at it, I think that the Afghan security forces did fight. Particular segments of it fought um, extremely valiantly. And, uh, but there are other elements that were, uh, I wouldn't say flawed by design because we built it in a, in a very uh, large, chunky, conventional way that was not really well oriented for an insurgency or a counterinsurgency. But I think also, for example, you know, if you had 30,000 policemen that were supposed to be on the roll uh, for Kandahar, you know, 3,000 show up. That it's not necessarily that that these big numbers are actually what are the numbers available to fight. Um, I think that, uh, to your earlier comments, um, I think one of the big failures for President Ghani was that he failed in governance in many regards because um, he, he put in place a system that was easily collapsible. Um, the, the, the Nimru's government fell quickly. The Kandahar government fell a little slower. The Baglan government fell you know, after that, the, 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 the Helmand. But all of these have some similarities. The provincial governors made a deal with the shadow governor and exited, saved their lives, and walked out. They effectively told their troops to withdraw or to leave or turn in their guns. And there wasn't so much of a fight. And the military leadership, um, so that's, that's the police, that's the local um, sort of security, and the military uh, basically lacked leadership in Kabul because they kept on changing a lot of the senior leaders within the ANDSF. So it's unfair to say that the, the military all of a sudden just collapsed, first of all. I think that there was um, an erosion of, of, the, of the institutions in many regards for years, um, and ultimately, um, I think that there, you know, misuse of different special forces, for example, for um, quite frankly conventional uh, aims, um, and then you know the the thing that killed it really uh, was the fact that we removed air power, uh, mechanics, uh, all the things that we said were instrumental, and there are multiple reports that say this, you know, DoD reports uh, that uh, they were instrumental in. If, maintaining the effectiveness of the, uh, of the Afghan security forces. I mean, there is a big difference when 2020, there were no provincial capitals that fell. 2019, no provincial capitals that fell. Keep on going backwards. And then 2021, it falls. So just to blame it on the ANDSF, I think is a little bit unfair. Ambassador Rahmani, there was a narrative that there was going to be a Taliban 2.0, um, that somehow it would be different. Uh, they le would learn from, you know, that Afghan society had changed, it's a much younger population, everybody has a cell phone, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, based on the cabinet appointments, the first round of cabinet appointments, is that Taliban 2.0? Um, I think it, it is uh, Taliban 2.0 only because uh, the resurgence is in 2021, uh, not really in any, uh, in, in terms of uh, the difference in, uh, term, uh, in their ideology or their actions. Like it was said before, uh, until this point, they probably haven't had a chance to deal with all the uh, rest uh, of the matters that they, they would like to bring under their control and the same sort of control that they did in 1990s. Uh, once uh, they have that opportunity, they would. And, and we have already seen signs of it. Uh, the, uh, the announcement they are making, the interviews they are giving, and, and um, they can't help uh, hide what they really think when it comes in terms of the individual freedoms, the rights of women, 
the freedom of expression. It, it is the, the same old story. And they also do not necessarily feel a, uh, any uh, uh, reason or, a, or pressure uh, to change, even if there was one, they, they are balancing it. They are trying to see what would help them keep uh, together their forces to help them stick together with one another versus making a change. Let me give you an example. Uh, I hear that in the Taliban's leadership, especially among the more senior people, um, there is a tendency for being a little bit more lenient or, or um, allow uh, certain um, uh, practices to, to continue to take place, uh, for women to at least attend school till 12th grade and whatnot. But uh, at this uh, point, they are faced uh, with a, a critical challenge. They need to govern, and they don't know how to govern. They, 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 they have no experience in governance. In addition, there is a possibility of fractions within their own forces in order to keep together, are they going to go and tell the commanders who fought for 20 years and they have been told since childhood uh, what is right and what is wrong, they have been trained to think in a very certain way that no, now that we have taken over, that has changed. That would uh, expose them even more to uh, uh, fracturing, and, and that's risky for them. So I don't think any there is necessarily sufficient form of pressure that would lead them otherwise, uh, let alone the fact that, that they themselves are not really much of different people because they kept it very clear, very concise, very sharp, why they are fighting, what the morale was, and that contributed to their success. Saad, you know, one of the big, it's so easy to talk about what, what went wrong in Afghanistan, but, and often people don't talk about what went right. Um, so what went right um, and you know, Tolo TV is still on the air. Obviously, you're doing a certain amount of self-censorship is, is what I'm gathering from what you're saying. Uh, I've seen reports of more than 100 Afghan independent media closing. I don't know, so if you could reflect a little on that. So what went right and how has the media landscape changed uh, since the Taliban takeover? Well, the, the country, um, so picture 2001, population of about 21 million. Uh, Afghans. Um, Get lean to the mic, into yeah. the mic. Yeah. Uh, 20, 21 million Afghans, and um, and today we have a population of almost 40 million, 38 million people. So the country is doubled in size. It's the youngest country outside of sub-Saharan Africa, median age of 18. 65% um, of the population is under the age of 22 or 23. So the vast majority of Afghans have never experienced anything like the Taliban rule of the 1990s. Um, by the way, and this includes Taliban fighters. Most of these kids are still using, you know, they're using social media, they're on Facebook. Um, they communicate, communicate with each other on Signal, Telegram, and, and so forth. Um, so it's a totally different Afghanistan to what the majority of Afghans experienced in the 1990s. Now, this population is vastly urbanized. Uh, they're more aspirational. They're better educated. So if you look at the... The younger population of, say, under 25s or under 30s, a clear majority, something like 75% are literate versus uh, the, you know, the, the national literacy rates run 40%, and it was run 20% in 2001. So you, you have a young aspirational population. Um, so th these are the things that went right, and the gains of the last 20 years are not going to be that, you're not going to lose them that easily because once you discover the earth is not flat, it's <laughs> difficult to go back to, to, to your old way of thinking. These people have, have either watched, you know, watching TV or they're, they're active on social media, they, they can communicate, they've got a mobile phone. I mean, in, in 2001, we only had 8,000 fixed lines. Today, a vast majority of 25 or 30 million Afghans have access to a mobile phone, of which a third has a smartphone. So you can't put the genie back in the bottle, and it's going to be difficult for the Taliban to go back to the 1990s. So uh, you ask about the Taliban 2.0, they're di different. Of course they're different. You know, we've got 
um, media that's still operational. We've got women on television. We've got debating programs where we have uh, Taliban officials being challenged by a lady sitting either across the desk from them or uh, on via Skype or via satellite in the studio. Um, uh, high school and middle school um, are back in many provinces in the north. I think we're up to seven or eight provinces where girls are going back to school. Um, private universities are, are still open with girls and boys. Um, and the, this is obviously a very different situation to the mid-1990s. My concern is that it's going to become more restrictive, even if it's not. As Dexter Filkins was pointing out, the Taliban became more restrictive from 95 onwards rather than the other way around. Um, what went wrong? Um, I think there was a disconnect between uh, don't judge Afghanistan on how the government performed. The Afghan government was corrupt, it was inept, it was hopeless, it was detached from the realities on the ground. Whereas the, 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 the people of Afghanistan changed dramatically in the, in the 20 years where the internationals had a presence. Um, and, and I think that we, 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 you know, there has to be, we have to all collectively take some pride for this transformational change we've seen in perhaps the most backward country on the planet. And I think the next, you know, the fact that we have women protesting on the streets of Kabul, this is a byproduct of the last 20 years where women can express themselves and they know how to organize and there's a civil society. Um, can, can we sustain these, these gains? I don't know, the jury's still out. And that's why it's important for the world to continue remaining engaged. You know, people talk about evacuations, but evacuations only impact 10, 20, 30,000 people, and on top of the 120,000 people that have left, let's focus on the 38 million people that are going to remain in the country. Um, so, you know, as, as most things, there is no black and white with Afghanistan. It's a, there are lots of shades of gray in terms of both gains and risks ahead. Gianni, you agree with that? Yeah, I think, I think fundamentally I, I agree with Saad. Um, I, I, but I think that from a, I'll play the U.S. part in this, um, that I think you could equally say the same about detached, not in touch with the reality on the ground, uh, rhetoric over reality check, uh, fantasy instead, instead of, you know, strategy. I mean, if there's something that can be said about the Taliban, um, uh, game plan, if you will, was that they've been very clear about their intentions. They've been very clear about what they want to do in terms of governing. Um, this notion um, that they were going to have a 50-50 government, they'd never, you know, been about that. They've never sat there and said, hey, yeah, sure, well, let's split up the ministries. Why don't we just do that? Um, so. I think this notion that we're going to achieve a political settlement by a particular time frame was, again, unrealistic and, and you know, quite frankly, a bit ridiculous. So, um, yeah, the point is, I agree with Saad's assessment of the of the Afghan portion, but I think that there's an equally uh, um, reflection that an equal reflection that needs to take place on the U.S. side. And similarly, you know, we can put all the blame on Ashraf Ghani, and the buck stops there for him. But, you know, on the other side, there's another uh, person in uh, Ambassador Haliza that should have also known better than to kind of take this process down a particular path that was, you know, those two are like on Mathelma and Louise you know, ending of going off the cliff together and when it comes to, um, you know, where did, the, where did, how do we get here? You know, H.R. McMaster, who obviously worked uh, with uh, Zal Khalilzad, has described the agreement that Khalilzad negotiated, which after all was also endorsed by Secretary Pompeo, and at the end of the day was endorsed by President Trump. He's described it publicly as a surrender agreement. Right. So, um, where does that buck really stop? I mean, is Zal Khalilzad really responsible for something that was, after all, something that President Trump said he was going to do? Yeah, look, I, I look at this not just as a you know, retired guy 
that used to do something. I mean, I'm looking at it from an analyst's perspective, and if I'm hired by somebody to be an analyst or be a subject matter expert, I, I own some of this in terms of um, you know, the advice that I give. Now, if somebody chooses to not follow the advice, um, that's a different story entirely. Um, but I think that if you look at 40 years plus of service to the U.S. government and a, a deep connection to Afghanistan, multiple assignments there, uh, you can almost say obsessive about Afghanistan, um, Ambassador Halizad should have known better and been able to raise the flag even if Ambassador Pom uh, or Secretary Pompeo or even President Trump and now President Biden. Um, and, you know, to, to say this is, this is going to end very poorly if we continue down this path. And instead, they've let, it, they've let it happen. And the same thing goes by the Department of Defense. You know, this whole notion of y you don't have a... Uh, who could have possibly seen this happen in 11 days? Or, you know, there is no collapse imminent. You know, we all thought they would fight. I mean, for years you've had CIA assessments, DOD assessments, you know, the CIGAR reports, all sorts of different information that should be, the breadcrumb trail is there, you know? Not to mention the Taliban rhetoric that was actually not just rhetoric. They were really like, hey, I am telling you what I'm gonna do with this. So, I think it's disingenuous to, 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 to suggest that uh, this wasn't, you know, you couldn't see this one coming. Ambassador Rahmani, you were ambassador during the period, um, President Biden, there's a deal in February. Biden says we're going to withdraw in April, repeats that in July. Uh, when you were talking to your, Amer your American counterparts in Washington, uh, I mean, what were you thinking privately now you're out of government? Um, and because there's been a narrative that, picking up what Yanni said, that somehow this was an intelligence failure. Was this an intelligence failure or was this a failure of policy? And, a fa and there's another dimension to this, and I'll ask Saab this same question. So the three, the three kind of levels of this. One is to say this was a policy failure. Another is to say this was a failure of execution and another to say this was an intelligence failure? Or is it all of those? Or none? Or what? <laughs> I would say it was all of those. And uh, to add uh, to it what uh, uh, the uh, generals uh, who were testifying uh, said, which is also a strategic fail failure. So um, it was a failure in all accounts. I am not uh, sure why would people necessarily uh, say this, uh, that they couldn't see this coming or, or the collapse was too fast? So they were not expecting it to happen in uh, less than two weeks. They were expecting it to happen in a couple of weeks. Um, that, in fact, that predictions were already out in public and that uh, the government is going to fail in 90 days and 60 days. Um, it, it was very clear. Would, were they expecting a different kind of collapse than the way that it actually did happen? So um, the, the uh, uh, intelligence, the analysis, everything was out there. And and also, uh, as somebody who lived uh, through the previous uh, collapses, uh, it was not um, surprising uh, for me at all because once you once the major provinces collapse, it is very clear that that it is uh, going to happen and it's going to happen fast. It was the same story in '96. It was the same story in uh, um, the beginning of the '90s uh, with the uh, remaining of the communist re uh, regime, and and. Uh, and it was it was just repeating the, the same way. Like uh, when President Ghani came here in June, it was very clear that uh, it's almost a done deal. Um, there was no significant substantive uh, outcome or discussion uh, during that visit that that would. Uh, point to a different direction. So that, that, that should have been clear enough even then. Um, I'm, yeah, I, I think it was failure of all plus uh, strategy. Saad? Well, um, 
I, I think this would have happened regardless. Um, the seeds uh, were sown in 2014 when, um, during a very fraudulent process, a man who should have not been um, in the running became president. Um, and, and that's when we, you know, people lost faith in the process. Um, and this man certainly didn't have the aptitude um, to run a country, to run anything, let alone a country. And um, he lost not just the support of the people, but he lost the provinces, he lost the political establishment, and he politicized the, the, the institutions, uh, the uh, appointments were made, um, not to, to help build institutions, but to strengthen his own position, but of course that was also flawed. I think it was always going to be inevitable uh, with someone like Ash Afghani in charge. Uh, the problem is that when you, uh, when, you, when you attempt to build a state, there are many different pieces. Um, you can't allow for uh, a, an election that was as fraudulent, fraudulent as it was in 2014 for that to determine the leader of the country and then for things to be normal after that. Um, I, Son, can I follow up on that? Mm. The United States put a lot of effort into the peace negotiations mm. with the Taliban. Would it have been smarter to put a lot of effort into actually making the election system in Afghanistan more legitimate? Absolutely. I mean, I think this is the frustrating thing for us because we did, the lo you know, most of the exposés came through our media outlets in terms of the fraud in 2014. And uh, it, it was just always, put the pe pe people put it in the too hard basket. Say that again. And they, they put it in the too hard basket. We don't want to deal with this fraud. We'd rather let these guys work together. Uh, it's too difficult for us to challenge anything. Hundreds of millions of dollars spent on the, on the elections by the UN and others, and they just allowed for the, for, for the, for the, for the fraud to, A, happen, and B, for the, for the results to stand. I mean, it's, it's, it, it was so frustrating and so depressing for us watching from the sidelines. I mean, we, weren't, we weren't just watching, we were reporting on it. Um, because the whole idea of elections is actually to, it's the will of the people. And that was not respected. So, Yeah, and you know, in 2000, the 2004 election, there was 70% turnout. I mean, that's more, mm -hmm. there hadn't been, I think the last time there was 70% turnout in an American election was in 1900 for a presidential mm -hmm. election. So, and you know, Karzai was elected, he had a sort of mandate. Uh, I think you got 55% of the vote. So it, and uh, that seemed to be- And the, and the voter be... turnout in the first round was actually quite high yeah. in 2014. Yeah, oh right. Um, but in the second round, it just people didn't bother coming out and, com coming out and, and, and voting because they had seen that fraud had occurred and no one was gonna care. Uh, right. right, so this is kind of the original sin then? Yeah, I, I think this, this is when it all began to go wrong. I mean, of course, the corruption, nothing. Yeah. Of course, those things incrementally weaken uh, the, the, the legitimacy of any state. But I think the elections was actually the beginning of the end for us. And I think with these, uh, uh, with these individuals who were at the helm running the country, who were so detached from the realities. I had this, these discussions with Ashraf Ghani. Uh, for example, he never watched Afghan media which is extraordinary. I mean, Karzai used to get, you know, in those days, it was before YouTube, he used to ask for DVDs of news, news bulletins. Ashraf Ghani was content to read the transcripts, you know, from the monitoring team, which, of course, they heavily censored, and there were lots of cutting and pasting. Uh, he was detached from what was really happening in the country. And I said to him, I said, Mr. President, you have to watch, you have to listen to a woman scream because her son is stuck in some outpost not getting ammunition, not getting food, for you to understand the pain of the military and the families of these young soldiers. And he had this look on his face. I mean, I obviously wasn't uh, convincing. I mean, I saw him two weeks before the fall of, uh, the, the collapse of Kabul. He still was in his own bubble. And I, you know, th this is, I mean, I was just watching a, an accident in slow motion. I, I think that a lot of mistakes have been made over the years. I think the most important one is this loss of legitimacy by, uh, by the state. Because when people saw the writing on the wall, you know, Afghans are very opportunistic. I mean, they've, they've survived for such a long time. And I've always maintained that people would just lower one flag and raise another flag. And people saw the writing on the wall, and they said, this state, this government is not worth supporting. They switched sides. 
and Ashraf Ghani had not done enough to win people over over the years. And of course, we go back to the Constitution, we should have had a more devolved system, it was deeply centralized, there are many, many things we can talk about, but I think essentially, um, I, I think I, I would go back to 2014 as being probably the single most important thing that determined the outcome in August of 2021. That's a very important point, and I think a lot of people don't understand that Afghanistan's been at war since 1978, even before the Soviets invaded. So I'm 58. Uh, my entire life would have been consumed by war if I was an Afghan. And so it's not that Afghans are cowardly or they, they saw which way the wind was going and they want to keep their heads on their shoulders, and, um, and they had really no loyalty to Ghani. Is that ultimately what happened? Well, I mean, I explained to someone, I said, if you announced to your wife, I'm going to leave you in the next six months, would you be surprised if you, she left you the next day? <laughs> so when you announce to the Afghans that we expect your government to collapse, the military to collapse within three to 12 months, why would a soldier keep on fighting? for? If the President of the United States is saying that, and when the generals are saying that in you know, congressional hearings, when they're being interviewed, now there's no incentive for people to fight because they're saying if the Americans believe we're gonna eventually collapse, why risk it? What's the difference between three months and three hours? Right. Yanni, from a military perspective, obviously Obama left 8,400, um, Biden had 2,500 or 3,500, depending on how you score it. But also there were the 7,000 mostly NATO troops, there were 16,000 contractors, 6,000 of the Americans. I mean, was that enough to maintain a fragile status quo? If we hadn't said we're withdrawing, we're withdrawing, we're withdrawing, was that enough? If you, if you allow me to just step back for a second yeah. on that one, I, I think that there is a big question of like, a, it's a bookend. You know, we either leave or, or go. It has to do with uh, insurgency, winnable, uh, Taliban, no Taliban. I think that if you step back and say, okay, where's the, where's the U.S. going right now? And if you look at it purely from removing yourself from Afghanistan, uh, the U.S. is worried very much about great power competition. And that's the big thing right now, is you worry about great power competition, China, Russia, Iran, to a degree, if you play the regional players. Um, but great power competition is significant. So from a perspective of great power competition, do you give up the longest runway in, in Bagram uh, in Central Asia? I mean, in terms of U.S. national security interests, Afghanistan was beyond a simplistic, you know, will Ashraf Ghani hold on to power? Will the ANDSF, you know, hold out? three to six months, will they stay or not? I think it, this will come back as a major mistake from our departure of Afghanistan in our grand strategy around the planet. It's not just about Afghanistan. Um, but, but to answer your point, um, you know, I think that um, ultimately it comes down to this. Our 20 years in Afghanistan, we have overspent and we have completely, we have not thought about it enough. So overspending and underthinking has gotten us to the mess that we're in. But so picking up on that, would the smartest and most sustainable politically in the United States and uh, strategy have been to go light and go long, never have talked about, about withdrawal? Yeah, yeah I, I think, I think the, 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 uh, yeah, the psychological impact of telegraphing your punch that you're leaving uh, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, it's a classic, uh, you know, I don't think Sun Tzu said, uh, you know, tell them what you're going to do that you're <laughs> leaving in six months and give up your runway before the evacuation is complete. I mean, this isn't based on any sort of theorist. Um, uh, but, but the patience with, look at it again, next engagement, not just Afghanistan. Um, we have to think about these conflicts as patience, thinking, long-term spending, not flood avalanche of, uh, of, of, of money that's coming in, going to a bunch of people that effectively you're sacrificing your integrity, your good intentions at the altar of expediency. When you hand out suitcases of money to warlords right up front, I can understand you're just trying to get, enter a country. But when you continue, when your game plan is to continue to pay these warlords and rely on them, 
And the 2017 uh, Department of Defense report to Congress said that uh, we have a reliant, re reliable and willing partner in Ashraf Ghani. They, they literally personalized it to an individual instead of a system, instead of you know, fixing the, the enterprise that will survive a guy like Ashraf Ghani or, or Karzai or anybody else. So um, yeah, I think we have to think long. We have to think um, small footprint. We have to think by, with, and through. I mean, we have to work through our local partners. But working through your local partners does not mean, hey, by the way, I'm going to yank out your maintenance. I'm going to, you know, your airplanes aren't going to work in three, six weeks. And, uh, you know, and we're leaving. Um, by the way, forgot to give you the, uh, the keys to turn on the generator at Bagram. So sorry if you don't have any uh, electricity, you know, for a while. So. Yeah, that's not, that's not good partnership. Ambassador Rahmani, um, you predicted before the Taliban takeover um, what the Taliban would do in terms of the status of women, suggesting that they, you know, the, the, the jobs for women would be very limited. And the mayor of Kabul, I think, said that women could work, but as only cleaning female toilets. Um, so how would you score what the Taliban have done when it comes to the status of women working and education for girls. When I say girls, teenage girls. Well, I am uh, still thinking the same uh, as, as I said before. Um, I believe uh, they have already announced that the girls uh, could not go to school beyond the middle school. In the provinces that they do go, it is because of the uh, communities, the culture, uh, more in, in, in those parts of the country. And it, it, is, it shouldn't be surprising because even before, Taliban usually, when they enter the uh, community, a village, and when uh, the community overall resisted to their very severe treatment, the harsh uh, uh, restriction on women, they, they um, just uh, relaxed a little bit. They, they, they played along because uh, of their nature, the way they work, and the way they are fused in the communities, they they all uh, they have always uh, been somewhat uh, closer to the grassroots and and basically taking the temperature and adjusting themselves. But in the in the uh, in the rest of the places where um, the more conservative provinces specifically, uh, it is. Um, a, I understand that not even girls are not even going to schools uh, for uh, uh, until the sixth grade because uh, the environment uh, is as such that they have said girls should stay home and the the, the communities uh, follow along. Um, they already uh, told that thirty percent of the Afghan civil service, which is which were, uh, was comprised of women to go back and stay home until the decision is uh, going to be made about them. 28% of the Afghan parliament were women. They are, well, oh, the entire uh, parliament is uh, out, but of course, uh, if, if, the, if the rest of them were to come, I am not expecting women would be among them. So uh, they are tightening the grip as they are going uh, along. Um, I believe that uh, uh, they have been uh, playing smart so far. And they are not making any major uh, mistakes uh, that, that would turn all the cameras back towards them as the news cycle and the interest uh, around the world fades and, and other issues come up. Uh, I, I think they, are, um, they have learned that, that, that patience and waiting uh, pays off. Um, I'm afraid that, that they are playing the very same game. Now, again, um, there, there could be <clears throat> differences and changes and they may have learned, but that would also depend on, on balancing uh, what they are going to get uh, in terms of what they are uh, in, in uh, exchange to what they are going to give. Telling their fighters to think differently, t telling their commanders to act differently, um, having different um, I, uh, sets of values and ideologies introduced, uh, that, that is, uh, that's scary and, and, and uh, fracturing. So they have to uh, balance that. 
Yeah, picking up on that, Saad, I mean, A, I, I thought I heard you say something slightly different than what Ambassador Rachmani has said about education for women and, and working. I don't know. Did you agree with her, or did you have a slight... Well, I, I, uh, half a dozen provinces now girls can go back to high school. Um, Where are they these more... Which provinces are they? I mean, in the north, predominantly. Yeah, in the north. Right. So it's more, that's more of a cultural issue that... Well, I think the Taliban have acknowledged that this is more of a cultural than a religious issue. I mean, they probably have to balance the demands of their constituency, constituencies and demands of the Afghan public as well as the international community. So then they're acting sort of more politically. Uh, and I mean, it shows a certain political sense rather than an absolute ideological... Yes, for now. Uh, for now. But, but, but I think the key thing, I, I'm not a commentator, I'm not an analyst. Yeah. Uh, I, I don't, uh, I'm a very practical individual. And I think from where we stand is it's what can we do to impact their behavior. Yeah. Uh, because this is not about you know me being right or wrong. It's more about what's in the interest of the Afghan nation, and it is what it is. They've taken over this country um, by being smart, by deceiving people like Ambassador Khalilzad, and eventually prevailing on the battleground. Um, and everyone else blinked first. They're in power now. We have to deal with them, and we have to work with them because what's at stake is. 38 million Afghans. Um, we have a political crisis of, because of because what's, what's been transpiring. We have a humanitarian crisis. We have a major drought in the country. We've got 700 to a million internally displaced people. Now we have an economic crisis where the world gave Afghanistan 13 and a half to 14 billion dollars a year, and it's gone to zero. You know, we, we will face, you know, something like 90 or 95 percent of the Afghan population will be under the poverty line within months, and winter's around the corner. So if we don't act fast enough, it's going to impact millions and millions of Afghans, and this is, has to be done collectively. From where we stand as a, as a local media organization, we're, we're doing what we can in terms of encouraging debate, challenging them, uh, uh, telling truth to power. and. We've seen some signs. I mean, I think some government uh, um, departments have allowed women to go back in. Just two days ago, the passports office has asked its female employees to go back, and certain other departments have also, are also allowing their female employees to return to work. Including Presumably, because they women would have to issue women passports to women rather than right. Is that well? It's a start. Right? Yeah. Um, and um, I'm not saying it's ideal, and it certainly wasn't ideal before. Yeah. Um, there were obviously major flaws in the previous government. But I think it's a start, and it's, I think we should... And this is why engaging the Taliban is so important, because, again, it's engaging them doesn't necessarily mean recognize them, but, but by, by talking to them, you can impact their policies on Related the question. I mean, the U.S. closed its embassy. We've, as you know well, everybody on this panel knows well, we closed our embassy in 1989. It turned out to be a very expensive mistake. And are we sort of, was that a mistake? I mean, like, you're, the Taliban are here. They are the de facto government, whether anybody recognizes them or not. Was it a mistake for the United States to pull the diplomatic presence out? Yeah, of course. I mean, listen, half a dozen other countries, I mean, the Americans cannot even go to Kabul. What's that? They cannot even go to Kabul, right? right. Um, the Brits are there, the Chinese have been there, the, 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 the Russians and the Turks and the Pakistanis and the Central Asians, they're all going to Kabul, engaging with them. And the Americans cannot even send a delegation. They've built this massive compound of, you know, for two, three hundred million dollars. They don't have a single American present on the ground. So, I, I, you know, you, you can't do this via Zoom. You've got to go and see these people face to face. I do know you, that they do have you agree with that, Yanni? Yeah, I, I, look, I mean, if there's a book title here, is Play Your Strong Hand Weekly. You know, it's, we had a very um, incredible amount of influence over the Afghan government, and instead of focusing on working with the Afghan government that we had an um, immense influence over, we started trying to influence the insurgency to maybe make them a little bit more moderate so we can somehow work with them. And similarly, uh, you, you know, we had enormous, uh, uh, you know, strength in our bases in our, you know, including the U.S. Embassy. I mean, that, good luck trying to, to take over that compound. Uh, and, 
we shouldn't have left. I mean, that's absolutely, look, in hi hindsight 2020 being what it is, I mean, we can all say that, but I think that it should have been the plan that if your political settlement is the objective, then remaining and continuing forward with it should have been part of that plan. Similarly, um, you know, did you not read any history up to 1992 and think, you know, what happens when the Peshawar Accords and whatever government of percentages is going to come into play that Kabul may actually fall quickly, uh, you know, or as Ambassador Rahmani mentioned, 1996 when, when you know, the, the opposition forces just walked out and the Taliban rolled in and pickup trucks. So. I mean, it's, uh, we should have known better and stayed. I mean, that's absolutely true. If I may, one thing yeah. though, Peter, um, it's really important to highlight the fact that there's zero chance that this is an intelligence failure. I think it's an unfair characterization because just like the Tolo News uh, you know, journalists, these young analysts from birth, basically, intellectually or professionally, they're told truth to power. They'll tell you know whether it's the director of the CIA or or the or the or or their boss that this isn't true what you just said. So um, I, I think it, too many people want to put the blame game on on that path, and I think it's absolutely not right. We have a few minutes remaining, and Ambassador Rakhmani, thank you. All, thank you for getting up early in Washington. Um, is there anything you wanted to add? Uh, well, what I would like to say is that. If we look at what happened the past 20 years, how it ended, where we are, there are a lot of variables and they are all interconnected. They all led, uh, one led to another one. Um, and there is an array of mistakes and um, um, blame on so many uh, parties, um, um, that, 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 that we can recount and, and analyze and talk about. But like it was said, we are where we are. Uh, and, and what is next? Uh, so it is important uh, to uh, focus moving forward and at least try to do some things differently. One of the things that was not the focus was uh, the people of Afghanistan communities uh, and how to help support them, how to strengthen them. Uh, from outside and inside, every the entire concentration was on politics because that was the uh, source of wealth, recognition, identity, everything, because it is it has been a country without a functioning economy. Therefore, politics was everything uh, for uh, all along. And, and the, the entire concentration was also uh, just uh, uh, on politics and on the individuals and on the leadership and, and how to deal with them and not to deal with them and what to do. So if, if we want to do things differently at any point, it has to be people centric. Something that, that hasn't been um, enough um, uh, taken, uh, being taken into account, and uh, the uh, the unfortunate uh, uh, consequence of that is that that the the very people of Afghanistan have been the collateral damage. Whatever happens, whether you you do not deal with the Taliban, whether uh, there is uh, sanctions, the freezing of assets, this and that. The, the, the suffrage always happens at the level of people. The government is corrupt, people are suffering. The army collapses, the people are suffering. And the conflict goes on, people are suffering. So uh, there, there should be a, a different way of thinking and strategy and a little bit of a patience um, and recognition that it is a complex situation and it cannot uh, be black and white uh, and timed um, according to our schedules. Saad. Well, I, I think um, I, I don't want to dwell too much on the past because we got to let people like you write about it in the future as to what went wrong. But uh, it was a blunder. Uh, I, I'm not questioning the decision to leave. I'm just questioning the way they left. Uh, the evacuation was very badly managed and we were privy to the thinking both in Washington and also elsewhere. So we understand that 
they just really dropped the ball. But going forward, uh, you know, they, I, I think the Afghan nation is very different to what most people imagine it to be, the people of Afghanistan. And, and to neglect them, I think, is, 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 is not fair. Um, and I think the world, especially now, especially what's after what's transpired over the last few weeks, owes it to the Afghan nation not to forget them. And I think that's why it's so important. You know, the forever war may have ended for the U.S., but the misery for the Afghan nation continues. And I think I urge our friends outside to, to bear that in mind. And I think we're very vulnerable. Um, and given what's been transpiring of late in terms of the economy, in terms of the the weather, you know, whether it's the drought, in terms of all the other problems the country's facing, um, it, it just not walk away from Afghanistan, I, I think is going to be my key message, you know, the forums such as this. Will the U.S. go back into Afghanistan, Yanni, in the 90 seconds remaining? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure, to be honest with you. I think that uh, to echo the, the sentiments here as, an, as a devout Afghan file, I will tell you that uh, we, we can't walk away from 35 million people who bought off on whatever we were selling. Um, and, and, I, and I think that it would be a great shame to, I, 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 I have an allergic reaction every time I hear that, you know, we need to save our Afghan allies. Well, for me, there were 35 million allies that we needed to think about, not just, you know, whatever thousands you want to put the number on. Um, so, uh, but are we going to go back? I'm not sure. Uh, should we go back? I'm not sure. But one thing's for sure, we need to learn from these lessons of what went wrong, not just turn the page and say, okay, well, that didn't go so well. We really need to put some thinking on it and also need to consider some thoughts in the parting uh, months of the conflict that are simply going to get us in trouble, like this over-the-horizon capability that we're uh, putting together. I think that that's, uh, that's, that's really a dangerous uh, characterization that I think it's a simplification. I think it's far more complicated. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, there, there are troubles in Afghanistan that are not going away. I want to thank Ambassador Rahmani, Saab Maseni, Yanni Koskinas, also Ali Sufan and his team. It's pretty hard to put together a, a major international conference uh, in the middle of a global pandemic. So I wanted to thank our brilliant panelists, but also thank the organizers of the conference. Thank you. <clears throat>